You, you, you are now listening to the Project Kuwait. To the Project Kuwait. To the Project Kuwait. Where we stop at nothing to bring you the right facts on health, fitness, and psychology. Featuring some of the world's most experienced professionals. Profession. So you can learn, live, and win. With your hosts, Meg, Dr. D, and Mandy. She had won a million dollars on a scratch ticket, lo and behold. Guess what? Six months later, she loses her house, her car, she lost everything. Everything. Most of these addicts are not communicators. They worry about expressing their feelings. So having family support is really important. And it's unfortunate. Some families here, they don't want to talk about it because they worry about what the society will say about them. Or they're so angry at the addict. All this and more in today's episode. Hey, everybody. Welcome to this episode of The Project. I was just ripping on Dr. Dinka because she doesn't know who (laughs) Bill Belichick is. Now, Probably a lot of listeners won't know who Bill Belichick I mean, is. I saw your post, but I'm like, why do I need to know everything? I don't understand. But I saw your post on Instagram. I just like, you know, I thought he was a motivational kind of guy. He's the least motivational. <laughs> he's the best NFL coach because he's so straightforward. In a press conference, they're like, why'd you guys lose today? He was like, we suck. And he just, he just went, he just went quiet. Like the guy's known to have as little, he just doesn't speak a lot. And He's very good at what he does. And he says, the point of being on a team is just to do your job. So there's this whole thing, this whole campaign of just do your job was going on for a couple of years. And that's the thing. We were talking Uh, about sports. Bill Belichick, if you don't know who he is, you got to read up on him. This guy's like, he's a psychological genius. All right. Why do you like him? Just, I mean, how did you even get to know about him? Because you're in sport? Yeah, well, I mean, I'm from... Half Bostonian. <laughs> like, what? Are, why are you giving me that lock? Well, I'm from <laughs> Boston, <laughs> New England Patriots, <laughs> New England Patriots, you know, Super Bowl, Tom Brady. I mean, I don't watch NFL. Do you watch sports? I don't watch any NFL. Do you ever watch sports? No. 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 The only thing I know is Chicago Bulls because I'm from Chicago <laughs> and I used to admire Michael Jordan. That's about it. That's the only thing I know. And I know everyone was buying his product. No, no. Michael Jordan is a guy who I'd love to get on the show. He'll never come on, but he's a psychological anomaly. He might. No way. He's a psychological anomaly. The guy had a (laughs) wicked bad gambling problem all throughout his NBA career. And from what I've heard, he still has a bad gambling problem, Uh, which I don't understand with athletes, especially like the really high caliber athletes. A lot of them have gambling problems. Michael Jordan Wayne Gretzky. I know, because they make so much money. They don't know what to do with their money or what? What the hell? No, but this has to stem from before they got all their money. Pete Rose. Do you know who Pete Rose is? Uh, Am I supposed to say yes? No. (laughs) You put me under pressure. No, no, it's it's okay. Pete Rose is probably arguably one of the greatest baseball players to ever live. Right. Now, he has been banned from baseball after he was caught betting on his team. Now, betting on your own team is a big no-no. Okay. That's a huge no-no. I mean, Shoeless Joe Jackson, he was a player for the Chicago uh, the Chicago Black Sox in the 1930s. You ever hear of the Black Sox? Yes. Yeah, they bet against their own team. For once, I have the right answer. <laughs> there you go. There you go, because you're from Chicago. And Shoeless Joe Jackson would have probably been the greatest baseball player to ever live. Probably greater than Babe Ruth. But he bet against his team, and he was never let back into the MLB. Same thing with Pete Rose. Pete Rose will die. And they will not put him in the Hall of Fame, even though he owns the record for the most hits because he bet against his team. Why is it these guys have everything in the world, but yet they will go and they will do the unimaginable and bet against their own team? It doesn't make sense. What would possess them to do that? Please answer me that one. They probably have like addiction issues, right? And it also they feel like, you know, they can get away with it. And, you know, the challenge of why people have gambling issues. I mean, why do people have, you know, gamblaholics is because they always feel like they're going to win. They feel that they've got this ability that they might go against the odd. And don't forget the adrenaline that they get out of like, you know, challenging, going, spending. And, and I feel like it becomes an addiction. I mean, even though these guys like, you know, Michael Jordan, he did they have a lot of money. Is it because they have a lot of money? It gives them fame? Is it the challenge? It can't be the money. Come on. It can't be the money. I mean, they were drowning in money. Like No, but I think it's the adrenaline. It's the adrenaline, I think. I think the idea of like them doing something that they know they can, they've got the money and they don't have to stress about it and then becomes an addiction. It can't be money. It has about winning. 
You know, most of these guys, why are they so famous? It's because they challenge themselves and they're winners. And I feel like they get into this gambling field of like betting against, you know, their team or whatever, because they love the challenge. They love the winning part of it. I don't think it's money. Here's my question. You're, you're a psychologist. It's an objective perspective. Now, I told you about Pete Rose betting against his own team and whatever, right? Um, now, here's my question. Do you think the MLB or do you think a sports body would be wrong to ban someone for life? Or do you think it's the sports body's responsibility to rehabilitate that athlete who has done that? Because I had this debate with someone a week ago and I said they gave him an olive branch and he spit back in their face in the 90s. So what's your perspective? Let's hear from someone that's not involved in sports. To be honest, and I think punishing you for life is just a little bit extreme. I think being able to give you an opportunity to rehabilitate, get your name back in there, giving you another option, another opportunity. I mean, so I'm like totally against these dictatorship really? of like- But he bet against his own team. I understand. He could have altered lineups. He could have altered things in order to go with the odds for them to lose or to win. That's wrong. I think the idea is, a but still, what did he learn by having him- being set out. I mean, for ideas, it's like, you know, you've got a team player who's really great. Yes, he made, or an owner of a team. Yes, he made poor decision. We all make poor decisions. Yes, it was a big decision that he made, but should we really not help him, you know, recuperate it, rehabilitate it? Having them just being banned for life, I don't really think that that is like makes any sense or what is it going to teach him? Nothing. It's not teaching him anything. Well, like the guy still goes to Vegas. I mean, if you know you have a problem and you don't do anything about it. There's a lot of people they know they have. Yeah, a- but is that the league's fault or is that your fault? Have you ever been in a casino? I mean, what I love about it is like in the casino, they have this number 1-800. I don't know what get help because they know that there's a lot of people that are gambling that really have a problem. And do you, how many people do you think they're really calling that number? Now, I don't know the statistics, but the idea is, is that gambling becomes an addiction. People know that they shouldn't be doing it. They know that this is harmful to their finances, to their family. I mean, I had a case like long time ago, you know, where the person like committed suicide. He had gambled his shop. Oh, wow. He had a liquor store. He had gambled his house. He thought that he was really going to make up the money that he lost. His family didn't know anything. So he goes and tries to like bet high numbers and he lost everything. He came, went to his shop and shot himself because he had lost everything and he didn't know how to face his family. He made poor decision. Yes, he couldn't face the consequences of his decision, but and of course, you know, committed suicide because he couldn't face and he left the family poor. They lost everything. So uh, can you imagine the anger the family had? Yeah. I mean, this woman was left with three young kids and she was surprised that now she doesn't even have the house that she was living in. It's traumatic. It's, you know, and the guy was, I feel like people that take these kind of actions, they run away from their problems instead of realizing he had a problem, maybe being able to tell his wife, maybe rebuilding again. There's always a possibility of rebuilding and getting better, but committing suicide, maybe it was an extreme measure because he can't face the fact or, you know, having these people be banned for life. I don't really think that that is really going to cure the problem. What they're going to do depends if they're narcissists, like some people we know, they are probably going to deflect on the problem itself and put it on someone else's responsibility. Or they might just like not take responsibility and not change anything and just stay in their cocoon. So I feel like we have to be able to punish people in a way where they're, we're teaching them a lesson, not that we ban them and abandon them. I don't know. I'm not really into that idea. I think banning, and I think it's a double-edged sword. I mean, you really think it's a good choice? It's a good choice for him to be banned for life? Yeah, honestly, yes, because it teaches other players a lesson not to do what he did. Let's look at Kuwait. We'll look at our society. Okay. You know how like they have a 3,000 KD fine or a crazy fine, 500, whatever, for not wearing a mask, right? How often do you go out and people aren't wearing a mask? A lot of people aren't wearing a mask because the rules are not, they're not reinforced. But implemented, that's right. If people got slapped with that fine, if like 100 people got slapped with that fine, everyone would wear a mask. No one would differ from there because they would not want to pay the price. Yeah, okay, I understand. You need to sacrifice one. Right, but that's a different scenario. Like I don't wear a mask and then they slam me with a, uh, you know, a fee of 3,000. Yes, that teaches me a lesson. At one time, 
you know, when the pandemic was, we were, and we had curfew, they were even naming people that were not following the law. So that kind of teaches a lesson to the other members of the society that you shouldn't do that. But banning you from the society because you didn't wear a mask, that doesn't make sense. Yeah, but sports is different because you're affecting your team. You could affect winning, you know, the championship just by altering a lineup or altering another player. How about giving you two years off? where you can go and get rehab. They gave him a chance. They gave him a chance and he spit in their faces. And then they gave him another chance. And the guy, they had so much damaging evidence of him betting on his own team that they had to use him as an example in American sports so everyone would follow suit. Imagine Muhammad Ali betting that he was going to lose a fight and he threw the fight. How many people would lose out of that? You know what I yeah, mean? Like, okay. So you kind of have to have those examples for everyone else in that sport. And I think, all right, you know, there's Pete Rose. There's uh, Wayne Gretzky was caught for gambling, but he said it was his wife, uh. not him, which I think is funny. <laughs> he just, he, he blamed his wife. And I'm like, dude, yeah. that's horse shit. That's like diffusing the responsibility, right? Putting it on someone else. I think Michael Jordan probably bet on the Chicago Bulls. You think? Oh, 100%. But Michael Jordan was so big, I think they couldn't do anything. Because if they had done anything, it would have destroyed basketball in the, the 90s. Bulls. Yeah, yeah, it's true. And they played it right. Whereas baseball, baseball, I love baseball for this. They don't care. They came out with the whole steroid thing in the early 2000s. They named all the best players. If you're in baseball and you get caught doing roids, even if you're the biggest personality, you're going to go down like a sinking ship. But I want to go back to what you said about gambling and being detrimental to lives. It is. For me, I look at gambling as, I think it's the worst addiction out there. I think it's worse than drugs. I agree with that, actually. No, pornography is also another but one. But gambling, uh, Dr. D. The gambling, it's so hard because, especially in the US, there's a casino everywhere. It's the same thing as alcoholics. Your addiction is everywhere, every corner, and trying to like discipline yourself from the idea of like not being around a casino or not being around people that gamble. And this mentality of like, like, I'm going to be rich and very quickly, I'm not really sure. I mean, a lot of people say that they got addicted because, I mean, if you ever like seen these slot machines, they give you a reward. It's like an interval kind oh, of yeah. scheduling, yep, right? Yep. So it's like they give you a little reward and you start to get addicted because you actually think you're going to win. And sometimes it does give you, so that $100 that they gave you or a thousand, let's say someone winning a thousand, the idea is that that motivates you that you think you're going to get another thousand every time you go. And before you know it, they're not realizing that. I mean, and it's like so hypnotic. I don't know if you've ever like watched people, which I have in casinos, they take their wallet and they're putting every 10, like let's say the machines, because I don't know anything about table gambling. So the machines, right? It's like so hypnotic. It like, looks like we know Dr. D was into the slot machines when she <laughs> went to the casinos. <laughs> but the two, to me, I feel like, I mean, for me, as does not attract me. The noise doesn't attract me, the stimulants. But that's all about psychology, how they have the loud music, how they have like all these lights. There's no clock. There's no clock or time, nothing. They pump in oxygen into casinos. They have waiters and waitresses giving free drinks. Yep. Two to three hours you've been there and you don't even realize it. Then they also there's a buffet where you can earn points now and get a free meal. They'll do anything to motivate people to stay in there. And it's like, you know, the way you take your money, it's like, I remember this woman as she was like taking her wallet and just putting 10 every time. Like, I don't really think she realized how many times she's put that 10. So probably by the end of two hours, she opens her wallet and she realizes that she ran out of $100, $10 bills, right? And because it's so hypnotic that it kind of attracts the idea that you are going to win. And there's like this impulsivity about this excitement that you might win after an hour, two hours. And like I said, owners of casino, they're not stupid. Like if they're going to make you millionaire, then they'll be out of business. I mean, that's the reason why they are in the casino business. So they can make money off of people that are not. To, and it's usually not really the millionaires. I mean, obviously the millionaires are gambling because they don't feel like they've got a lot of money, but it's usually the middle class. Oh yeah. They chase after it. Of course, because they think that they're going to get the money to pay off their bills. Or I remember when I had, I had just had my master's and I worked at this non-for-profit organization. I had this woman I was working with for a long time where she was like, seriously, I mean, she was on a disability check, right? And I mean, at that time, maybe it was like $500, $600. She could barely make her rent, but she was at the casino. And a lot of times they don't tell therapists. 
because, you know, we don't really talk a lot about finances unless they're, you know, they're all psychologists that financial advisors, they can do that. But, and then I realized, I was like, why is she stressed every time in the middle of the month? She's got, she's broke. And, you know, of course we were offering them, it's not for profit. So it's free service. Finally, I realized that, you know, she tells herself, I'm, I only have $20. Let me just go to the casino. And, and she lived close to one and, and she would go and $20 will end up being a hundred dollar, 150. By the time she leaves the casino, she's depressed because now she has no money for the rest of the month. Yeah, You know, she didn't calculate it because there's this wish that I'm going to get some money today. That's the scary part. And I think it's the people around you that have to realize the problem. There are people that I know that have literally bet their kids' tuition fees and book money Uh. in a casino. And it was just a revolving thing. And my friend's parent never realized they had a problem. And when he told me, he was like, yeah, you know, my mom bet away my sister's tuition, college tuition fees. And, you know, she's done all this stuff and she bet her book money. And then lo and behold, you know, she'd won. She'd won like a handful of times, but she'd lost more than she'd won. Yeah, of course. It's like the rat experiment where it was like the rat hits the button, it gets a reward, it gets food, and then it hits the button three more times, but it gets electrocuted, yeah, but it's still the... trying to get that reward of food. Right. I mean, that's, that's what it is. It's, I mean, it talks about these interval scheduling, right? And the thing is, is that the, the worst one that can get you addicted is that that ambivalence, right? So once sometimes the rat got the food and sometimes it didn't get the food. So that's like intermittent intervals where, you know, and this is what gambling is all about. Sometimes you get rewarded and sometimes you don't get rewarded, but because of the one you did get reward. So you don't know. They really, I mean, there's a lot of superstition like, no, 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 you use this machine. And if it, it goes, it's going to pay ultimately, it's going to pay. Oh yeah, it's ultimately going to pay, but you don't know if it's going to pay you, you know, two hours, one hour, you don't know. So you're waiting. And while the time that you're waiting to get paid out, right? What happens is like, you've already spent a lot of your money. So if you do get, yep. people are like very cautious and they're not, so those people like they'll go for fun and they realize my budget is only a hundred dollars. I'm leaving. Yeah. Those are the smart people. Yeah. But those are not the addicts, yeah, no, right? The addicts will go with their bank cards. Smart people will say, you know what? I'm not going to bring my bank card. I'm just going with a hundred dollars in my pocket. Yes. That's it. But back to my friend's story. So their mother had won. She went on to winning a couple of other times and then she went on to losing more and more. And then she had won a million dollars. Oh, okay? wow. She had won a million dollars on a scratch ticket, lo and behold. Wow. Guess what? Six months later, She's broke. she loses her house, her car. She lost no. everything. <gasps> everything. Oh my God. Everything. She had lost everything. So she had lost her house. Wow. That was... Definitely worth more than it was sold for, but it was repossessed because she couldn't make the payments. After a million dollars, I would have yep. stopped at it. That's the thing. Someone that has a gambling addiction, they don't realize how much they're actually spending. And look, I'm going to be honest. When I was in college, yeah, I fell into the trap of buying scratch tickets. Kuwait used to have scratch tickets. And then they realized it was a sort, you know, it was a type of gambling. We won those scratch tickets. They're fun. Scratch tickets are fun. Yeah. But when you overdo it and you keep chasing... I bought a scratch ticket and I was like, oh, you know, whatever. I'll spend like 10 bucks and I won a thousand dollars on a scratch ticket. You know, like I won a thousand dollars. What is the statistical availability of that? You're going to win another thousand dollar next week or the next week. Statistically, people need to understand. That- oh, it was like 1%. It was 1%. Exactly. And I think people don't know. That. But I spent more money trying to win again. And it didn't happen. Like I lost more. Like I probably lost 3000 to the thousand I won. Of course. But you keep chasing that rabbit. And unless you're really smart and you realize it, you're going to keep going after. Do you know there's a lot of people here in Kuwait actually that have bad gambling problems when they go outside of Kuwait? Of course. I met a guy who lost all of his money and everything in Egypt. And he couldn't get back to Kuwait because he had gambled it all in the casinos. Yeah. I mean, no. I mean, what are you talking about? Even here, even though it's illegal, people gamble. They play cards here. They also gamble on horse racing. So the idea is, is that this addiction and, you know, here they might be addicted. So I feel like it's a lot of to do with personality traits. So they might be already addicted to something else, for example. Right. And then they go outside of Kuwait where there's more accessibility of gambling and then they'll they will go ahead and Makes sense, yeah. be addicted to something. I mean, people with addictive personality, unless they know that they, you have to be aware that I have an addictive personality or it's genetic 
or like if you've got parents who are gamblers, you probably know that you've got the addictive gene and that you should not be even trying to get into gambling because you're not going to be able to have control over it because that stimulation causes you to be more attracted to it because you've got the gene versus people that don't really have gambling in their family. But if you have any sort of addiction, then you have to know that because you have addiction, you have to be more careful about the way you're drinking or the way you do gambling or People need to be more aware of what genetic predisposition they have in their family. So that way we can be careful. If you've got a parent who is an alcoholic, then getting into drinking or drugs and thinking that, no, 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 I have in control. I'll never be like my dad. Then it doesn't make sense because you are going to be more attracted. You might get addicted to it faster. And so people need to understand. So, and I'm sure people that are addicted, and it's so interesting because talk to someone that is like addicted to drinking and then they'll stop drinking, but then they'll go into another addiction of some sort, right? Something that may be more safer and more legal, but they'll yeah. be addicted. But isn't it important also to find the triggers that cause- Of course. That trigger our yes. addiction to spiral out. Of, like I know a lot of people, you know, they live normal lives or whatever, but something will snap or something will happen in their life. A stressor will come along and then it will cause them to bend the other way fall back into that trap. It was just like the guy I was telling you about that I want to bring on the show who has a heroin addiction here in Kuwait. Yeah. You know, we don't deal with addictions the proper way in Kuwait. I think that's no secret that we treat addicts like criminals when we don't realize it. It is a genetic disease. Yeah, true. Very true. And it's sad. It's really sad. And people are judgmental, you know, nobody wants to talk about their addiction because they know that people will judge them that being bad or they're doing something haram or so the idea is that People with addiction, they don't talk about it and then end up keeping it as a secret and then using the, you know, whatever the drug of choice is to numb themselves because they feel embarrassed themselves and they feel shunned by the society. Of course. So the idea of like, if we can have people to recognize that this is a disease and that it's curable and that we can work on trying to find support system for these individuals, then maybe more people will talk about it. There are a lot of people that are having addictive problems, even if it's not drugs, it's pornography, oh, it's yeah. gambling. It's- and we're going to bring someone on to talk about porn addiction because I think porn addiction in Kuwait is huge. I think in the Middle East. We need to talk about it, actually. Yes, yes. In my experience, I've seen it a lot. I mean, a lot of times you'll see it. And this addiction starts like, you know, early puberty and they think that it's normal. And then they realize that this is, you know, coming out of hand. And then when they get older, but also in my part, because I do a lot of couple therapy, I see it, how it plays part in people's relationship where he was addicted before he gets married. And then when he gets married, the relationship or the intimacy is not the same as he imagined because he's been mesmerized or in this false perception because of what he's seen. Is this what intimacy is all about? So I think it's it's an important thing. I think we really definitely need to do a show on this because I think people need to be aware of the seriousness of this particular addiction. And I know that, you know, I mean, from my experience, I see it a lot, but people don't want to talk about it, right? They're embarrassed. Like if you say after a couple of sessions and someone might say something that I'll probe into, okay, this, is this a problem? Is this not a problem? Uh, is this like controlling your relationship, especially in couple therapy, like he'll keep it a secret from her. He won't tell her that he's been watching a lot of porn and he's too embarrassed, but then she catches them. But then the woman takes it into the idea, especially in this culture, that there's something wrong with her. You know, she starts personalizing it when really it's not about her. It's about an addiction he had that he hasn't really admitted to himself that it's an addiction. A lot of people don't admit that this is an addiction. They think this is a release. This is something that they thought it was normalized. And then until it gets out of hand or it's affecting their relationship or their intimacy, you know, it, it does do that. So it's the same thing as gambling. People keep it secret. Can I believe how many people, even in the States that I work with, they wouldn't even tell their family where they're going. Like they'll say to their family, they're working late because it's such an embarrassment, right? They keep it a secret. They're in the casino for an hour, two hours. And then later on, the wife will find out that that's what he's been doing. Let's try and break this down to listeners. Say we have a family member that is a gambleholic or they're addicted to gambling. All right, let's stick with gambling for now. We'll go to the other things later on in other episodes, but let's stick to gambling. Now, 
we don't have the resources like they have in the United States and throughout Europe. Right. So what can I do here? What type of an intervention can take place to help that, you know, gambling addict in the family? I think the first thing is recognizing that you have an addiction, just like any other addiction, right? And you know, the idea is that to go to a therapist really works with addiction. Like anyone that works with substance abuse, they can also work with gambling addiction. It's, it's you know, it's all addiction anyways. So recognizing that it's a problem, having the support of the family and being honest. I mean, you know, people with addiction, they lie so much because they are feeling guilty. They know what they're doing is wrong. It's like their biggest secret. They worry about people rejecting them, being shunned from the society. So they keep it such a secret that they've learned how to lie a lot. They lie about how they're spending their money. They lie to their family about, you know, the debt that they're in. By the time the family finds out that they are broke or they've taken a lot of no- loans and they're in debt, by the time the family realizes that this person is not managing their money, it might be a while because they do so well covering it up. So once the family finds out that there's something wrong here and this person has an addiction, recognizing it and looking really for a professional help that can really target this addiction. Like, you know, I mean, my thing is like, I'm not a a specialized in substance abuse or even any addiction, but there are people in Kuwait that can work on individuals who have an addiction and we need to find those individuals and start getting treatment. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of the support groups that the U.S. have or like this 1-800 number if you're a gambler call. 1-800 Gamblers Anonymous. <laughs> yeah, but the other thing is, is that what my, some of the people I work with, do you know what they do is they reach out online. There's a lot of support group online, actually. That's true. Yeah, that is very true. I mean, nowadays anyways, this is the only way to be able to do it is to get support group, read up on what people are saying about their addiction, read up about what helped them. Again, the family has to be involved. You know, I've seen families here, like once they know that a family member has addiction, they don't want to talk to him. They're angry. No, they don't want to talk about it. They kind of like sweep it under the rug. And I think that's the worst thing people could do. I think because parents take it personal. They think that they've done something wrong, which probably they did. Not wrong. <laughs> but they probably Because most of all addicts, if you think about it, they've come from families that are either control, yeah, right? Yeah. Or the family that has addiction already. You know, there's a lot of dysfunctional communication and most of these addicts are not communicators. They worry about expressing their feelings. So they numb themselves using addictive products, right? So having family support is really important and it's unfortunate. Some families here, they don't want to talk about it because they worry about what the society will say about them or they're so angry at the addict that they want to just like, you know, dismiss him or, you know, have him just like kick him out or do whatever, because it is disappointing. I mean, you know, imagine you're a parent, you've spent all your time raising this child who ends up ultimately getting into heroin or cocaine or, you know, gambling. And gambling is so hard to catch here because people do it so under the table, right? And the first step is to recognize it, have family support, look for rehab. And now I've worked with people here. They've gone to rehab like in India. There's a rehabilitation in Egypt. We have a rehabilitation here. I've heard you go into the rehab here in Kuwait and you come out worse than when you went in. And that's what I've heard from ex-addicts, to be honest with you. I don't know. I mean, I know the guy that runs it. He's, you know, Dr. Adil Zaid. He's really good. He knows his stuff. I've taken my students there for a tour so I can bring kids aware because, you know, a lot of these kids are... I know previous addicts that have been to the rehab here and they have said... If you want to go to a rehab center, you go outside of Kuwait. It's true. They don't have the 12-step program here, from what I've understood. No, no, no. We have 12-step meetings. No, we do. We do. Is the outpatient good? Because I heard the outpatient was crap. No, no, not the outpatient. If you go to like AA and NA meetings, you know, you got a lot of support where you learn about the 12-step. And we have them here. Obviously, they're not advertised as much, but we got the support. Once you are in the loop, you'll know it. They have outpatient here, of course. So even, even the rehab center? Yes, of course. The process is, is that 28 days, they'll put you in an inpatient because I mean, I've taken my students there and the whole department knows me. So every year I take my students because I know that college kids have a high risk of like addiction, marijuana, weed, whatever. I mean, well, I'm, wait, 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 let, let's, let's be clear here. Marijuana, weed, you don't get addicted to that. That's not it. Of course you get an addicted to it because the one here is no, not- No, it's not. Scientifically, it's not. Not scientifically. We're talking about here. Here it's hash and opium. Here it's hash and opium and that crazy shit. But marijuana, you don't get addicted to marijuana. No, 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 no. It's not medically approved here. So of course there's addiction to it. 
What are you talking you about? You can't get addicted to marijuana. Of course you can. Why not? There are no addictive properties in marijuana. Of course. We're, are you talking about the medical marijuana? We're talking about the marijuana that they're selling here that is very not pure. I'm talking about normal marijuana that people use in the United States. You don't get addicted to. I mean, we're talking about here. We're not talking about American. We're talking about the product that they bring here. Whatever they bring here. Like, I don't know, to be honest with you, but I know. I mean, I don't know either, but. I know that there is an addiction. There is a marijuana addiction. There's weed addiction. There's a lot of addiction here, especially when you're in college and you want to experiment. So the idea is that I take my students so they can understand what services Kuwait has because you always get into this discussion with Kuwait doesn't have this, Kuwait doesn't have this. Kuwait has a lot of things. One of the things, maybe we're not advertising it as much. Maybe we're not putting it out there, but it's not true that Kuwait doesn't have this. And we've got some people that really know how to work with addiction, except that, you know, you just got to know who they are and how you can get a hold of them. But, you know, there are some people that will go outside, not because we don't have the services here, Mahdi. They go because they don't want anyone to know that they're kids. It's categorized as marijuana use disorder. That's how they categorize it with marijuana. Hence why they have distilleries in the States. So there is a disorder. There is a disorder, but it's legal in the States because the addictive properties, it's less addictive. Yeah, we're talking about here. Here, I don't know about the drugs here. Remember, in the States, we can't compare in the States because in the States, we have a dispenser. We've got somebody monitoring it. We've got it medically approved. We're not talking about, we don't have those access here. So people that are getting a hold of marijuana it's the marijuana that is going to get you addicted. It's not that medical marijuana, unless you bring in some from the States, which, you know. And then the idea is, is that people are going to get addicted here. They need to have services. You know, I love because my students constantly will say, if we're talking about addiction, oh, but in the States, it's legal. Well, we're not in the States. The type of supervision we have in the States, we don't have here. The medical rules that we have in the States. It's not here. So I, you know, don't compare what we have here to the States. All all the time I get asked and challenged by students that it's illegal. It's legal in the U.S. Well, it's not legal here. We shouldn't be doing it. And you don't know what the stuff is. And that's why we have addiction. And that's why it's a disorder. And people need to understand. I work with a lot of people saying, oh, you know, I do it once in a while. Uh, Okay. So how is it affecting your life? How is it affecting your perception? How is it affecting your judgment? Oh no, it doesn't really affect. And most of these people are downplaying it because they don't want you to confront them and let them know that this is an addiction. A lot of people don't want to be confronted. No, it's true. That this is an addiction and you need to get treatment because it's scary. Can you imagine like if I'm talking to you and suddenly you say to me, well, you've got a problem and all along you've justified it to yourself that this is you know, something okay, because I read it in the States. This is, well, we're not in the States. And we need to really become more aware of things that are happening here instead of trying to constantly compare ourselves to the West because it's not. And so people that know they have a problem or family members, instead of closing their eyes. I mean, it's interesting because a lot of times parents will know something is wrong with their college kid, let's say, because their behavior is different. They are spending more time in their room or out of the house. You know what I mean? They're isolating themselves. So there must be something if it's not because of drugs or something else. But parents, I think they're afraid to confront the issue because they don't know what to do. So they become overwhelmed and they just let it go. Making excuses that he's studying or making excuses, oh, he's with his friends. Or, you know, even though there might be legal problems, they've been caught a couple of times speeding, for example. They've had a lot of car accidents. All of these are signs of something. But parents need to be much more aware. And sometimes it's overwhelming for parents that are not into psychology. I mean, but the other thing is, is that because we don't have a lot of services like we do in the U.S., in the U.S., it's like we have them. We have options. Obviously, some you have to pay for, some not. But I don't know, you know, a month ago or two months ago, I don't remember when we were maybe quarantined. I saw something on Instagram that there is this new program that are helping with addiction. But I don't, I can't remember what the name was. There is. So if anyone knows, send us a message. I think the Middle East, the biggest problem that is growing that no one's talking about, at least America, they're talking about the growing heroin pandemic over there. But over here, I mean, since I've been in high school, heroin has been a huge problem in Kuwait. I mean, heroin and now crystal meth, Shabu. It's really bad. And we're still not dealing with these issues in the right way. We're not having anti-drug campaigns. We're not having D.A.R.E. You remember D.A.R.E.? Yeah, I remember D.A.R.E. Did you guys have D.A.R.E. in Chicago? Yeah, yeah, of course. D.A.R.E., yeah. You know, there's no D.A.R.E. programs here. D.A.R.E. is a national program. And we don't have D.A.R.E. here. That's true. 
Actually, I was talking to somebody about that because, you know, here the school, like, oh, because Larson is in the US and he's like, he's getting introduced to a lot of like, you know, health and wellness, things that how to say no to drugs, pressure, like things that you really need to have here. But here again, the idea is that there is this fear that if you talk about something, that it becomes reality, right? I totally disagree about that. We need to have these camps. I mean, we've got the rehab, we have the inpatient, we have the outpatients. That means there are people that are like utilizing these services. Why don't we have an anti-drug campaign? Why don't we talk about, you know, make sure that our kids understand the ramification how this is going to affect you for the rest of your life. I think we need this, to be honest. I know. And that's why I'm glad we're doing it on this show. And this is the perfect segue into our new series that we can talk about, addiction and starting kicking it off with gambling. And who knows, maybe yeah. the next one we could do on uh, steroids, because that's just as bad as any other addiction out there. Uh, steroids. Oh, yeah. We forgot these that These fitness people, man, they are addicted to them juices. They're addicted to their roids. But, you know, I don't understand. Why do they not think steroid is an addiction? That's why I don't understand. Because they're idiots. When you talk about steroid, they act like it's something normal in Kuwait. That's the thing. It's been normalized. They're idiots. It has been so normalized in society here. Dr. D, I've known cops, police officers, all right, that arrest people for drugs who do steroids and don't think it's a drug. Steroids are a drug. Yeah. I think it's a class C drug in the United States. You go to jail for selling steroids or ingesting steroids now in the United States. It's not like before where you could get away with selling it at the local gym or buying it at the gym. Now you're going to jail. They're treating it like cocaine in the States. And here, they're going to treat a heroin addict worse than a guy that's addicted to steroids who's probably engaging in domestic abuse and a lot of crazy things because roid rage and all the stuff that accompany it. That's going to be a good episode to talk about. It's very important to educate people because it's true. It always amazes me. Like I had a friend one, oh, somebody that was teaching with us. You probably know him if I told you his name later. And he was like saying that whenever he goes to the gym, you know, obviously, you know, I've been training in the house for a long time or in my gym, but he was saying that sometimes he goes to the gym and he'll see needles. Oh, everywhere. On the floor, you know, everywhere. And I was like, oh my God. And he's like, yeah, I mean, you could tell that, you know, it's so often that people are using steroids, not thinking that they're addicts. Exactly. This is a drug. Down by your daughter's school the oxygen and the platinum gym that's right, the parking lot that is across the street from a school. If you walk out in your car, you will see the ground littered with needles. If you did that shit in the States, you would get arrested. If you threw a used needle on the ground next to a school, you're going to jail. Here, it's normalized. It's so messed up. Because when I stepped out of my car to go to oxygen, I got out of my car. And the first thing I noticed is the school that was right behind me And I'm walking and stepping on needles. I'm like, what if a kid crossed over here and picked up a needle and, you know, poked themselves with it and got hepatitis C or anything or any any disease from some scumbag that used a needle to go to the gym to, you know, blow up his arms? That's something that really pisses me off. And but the other thing is, is that why it's true, because I've heard a lot of these stories where people walk into the gym, especially, I mean, men's gym, you know, some of my colleagues have said that. But what I don't understand is like, okay, so you've used a needle. Forget about it's an addiction or not right now. Why is it that people can't clean up after themselves? Like you don't want a kid to come over. I mean, can you imagine like some of these kids after they're 14 and 15, they are going to the gym. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, because you're allowed to to train after 15, right? And they're seeing it. They're probably wondering. The trainers are offering it to them. Do you know how cheap steroids are in Kuwait? Wow. They are extremely, oh, yeah. Steroids and Quay. Wow. This is all for the next episode. Yeah. I'll give you the rundown on all this crap, Dr. D. Oh, wow. I can't wait. And you know you know what? I'll expose all the dirty laundry. I'll expose all the dirty laundry. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I'll even tell you about the scumbag that goes on Instagram and gives out courses on how to take HGH and how to match it with steroids. And this son of a bitch hasn't been put behind bars. I've had my baseball kids come up to me and say, coach, should I try this? And if I saw this guy walking down the street, I'd beat his ass. I'd beat his ass because he is normalizing it and he's a legal drug dealer. And to me, he's probably, he's screwing up their hormone profiles and these kids are just doing more damage to themselves when they hit their mid thirties than they even understand. And it pisses me off to high heaven, to be honest with you. So that's an episode in its own. Okay. Don't get me going, Dr. D. We know what we're going to talk about. <laughs> pissing you off. Yeah, I like that. Yes. Okay. Well, 
Uh, in the next episode, we'll be exposing a lot of people. Stay tuned. <laughs> enjoy, enjoy. And remember, if anyone you know is suffering from gambling, look for the signs and symptoms and find a reach out program for them to join and have an intervention and take care of your loved ones. Thanks for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed it, please head over to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. You can also find us on Instagram at The Project Kuwait. Thank you, and join us next time.